and all through the week we've been talking about marijuana and we've been talking about what a dangerous drug that it really is. And the reason that we're talking about that is because the opinion about pot is changing quickly in America and people are, are not only no longer believing that it's dangerous, they're actually beginning to extol the health benefits and the medical benefits of pot. But I want to tell you that it's not so. Uh, it's so great to have our friend Lily Newman here with us this evening. Lily was with us on Wednesday night. She gave a blunt talk about marijuana to parents and to grandparents on Wednesday evening. And Lily's come again this morning to be with us. She is the director of outreach and prevention education at St. Vincent's Hospital in Harrison, New York. She travels all over Westchester County, Fairfield County, New York, uh, giving speeches in schools, talks in schools to students. She is a licensed addiction recovery counselor, a social worker, and most importantly, she is a follower of Jesus Christ and someone who has been set free from drugs by Jesus. I want you to give your very best welcome to our friend Lily Newman this morning. This is, this is round four. We're doing it. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I love being here. I just thank Pastor Glenn for having me here and giving me this opportunity to share this information. That's what I want to do. I want to give you information. So for those of you that are smoking, maybe when you go to light up, you'll take a hit and then you'll remember some of this information and you'll pass it and that might be the last time. That's what I hope. When I, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I've been working with kids for the last 10, and I would say that to them. All I want you to, people say, well, what's recovery to you? If someone takes a hit and remembers any of this information and passes it and says, no, thank you, that's a step. So I'm here just to give you information and as they say in the rooms, if it don't apply, let it fly, and whatever you could use, take it. The first slide is teens say the darndest thing. When they come into treatment, they defend and hold on to their using, and this is the things that they say. Pot is not addictive, it's not harmful. Of course, they always say that their parents smoke because we parents will sometimes discuss our history, and our kids hold on to it, and they'll go, well, look at them, they're doing fine. Oh, and they know plenty of successful people that smoke pot and it hasn't affected them. It can't be bad, that's the best one. They always tell me God created it, it's natural and it's a plant. And how bad could it be for you? Oh, and they do better in school. They have convinced themselves that they do better when they're high. Parents, I have parents that come in and this is what they tell me. I smoked pot when I was a kid and I turned out all right. They'll grow out of it. Oh, and I'd rather my kids smoke in the house downstairs in the basement in the backyard because that way, if not, they'd be out on the street in the playground, in the park, in the cars, they could get arrested. So better they do the illegal stuff, smoking pot in the house, than out on the street where they could get in trouble. I can control how much they smoke or so they think that if they're using in the house, they could watch them, okay? And pot isn't harmless, it's harmless and it's not addictive. Pot today is 20 times stronger than it was. I don't think anyone in this room ever used, but if you did, it's 20 times stronger now. Next. This is what it looks like. If you have this growing, I say it every sermon, if you have this growing in your house, get it out. It's illegal. It's a pretty plant. It's not supposed to be there, though. Next. This is the bud. This is what they take, the bud. They crush it up. They get it crushed already. They're not spending money on this. They use it to smoke, and they also bake it with brownies, and they make cookies out of it. And that's what the plant looks like without the bud. So if you see any of this stuff in your house, start having your antennas go up. And this is to give you information so if you see... Certain things, you'll start to go, oh, ah, next, my kid's using. THC is the agent that's in pot that gets you high and it's mind altering. It has over 400 cancer causing ingredients in it. 
and it can cause serious problems expressing feelings and handling emotions. When you start using, you stop growing emotionally. So just think about that. If you're a young adult, I'm telling you that if you start smoking 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, that's when you stop growing emotionally. You grow up, your body changes, but your emotional growth. And try living your life really having the emotional growth of a nine-year-old. You does lead to dependence, and when you stop using, you suffer from withdrawals, anxiety, agitation, changes in sleep and mood, and you're cranky as all get out. Next. Oh, I found this. This, our kids use anything they can to smoke pot out of. This is a young man who's taken his three Xbox controllers. Next. Smoke pot. I don't even know if they're smoking joints anymore. The blunts I know they're using, they take the black and mild, they're cheap cigarettes, take the tobacco out and fill it with pot. That's about four joints in that cigar. I'm giving you this information so if you see any of this stuff, the package of black and miles, start thinking, what are they using it? Why do they have it in the house? A soda can. Take a soda can, make a hole in the top, the bottom, hold it, so if you see soda cans with holes in them, they're using them as pipes. I'm not going to point out the kid who's smiling. Okay, now, you can also buy that, but that costs money. So they're making it out of the water bottles or a can. Next, oh, this. These are grinders. Would you know that this is something they use to grind pot if you saw it in the house? I wouldn't. Those up there, the eight ball, the pot leaf, I would think. And those watches, they're grinders in them. So now you can take your drugs, grind them, and smoke them everywhere without it being conspicuous. Next. He, oh, this is my personal favorite. I learned this working with the kids in treatment. See the bounce, those sheets, the dryer sheets? They put them in the empty roll of the toilet paper, and it acts as a filter so that when they smoke and they inhale it, they blow it through the and it catches the smell, so you don't smell it in the house. And if they have the window open and incense burning, you're not gonna catch it. So to hide the smell of that pot, that's ingenious. Another tip, if you see this stuff in their room, start asking questions, please. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story. My girlfriend, Claire, her mother, Helen, would find her silver spoons with burn marks on the bottom and she'd collect them and she'd wash them and then she'd keep finding the spoons. So, and bloody tissues in her room. So one day she said to me, Lil, I see all my good silver spoons burned on the bottom. I don't understand it. I said, well, your daughter's shooting up heroin and she's using the spoons to cook the heroin. She said, nah, that's not possible. My daughter wouldn't use my good spoons. Not that my daughter wouldn't shoot heroin. <laughs> My daughter wouldn't use my good silver. And this woman really had good silver. I said, no, no. That's what the kids are doing. When you have 15 kids in the room, that's what they're doing. And you see the bloody tissues? That's what they're using it for. You know, shoot up, you get a little blood, you know, you, you know whatever. She couldn't fathom that this was going on in her house. So I say that, that if you see stuff, if it looks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's usually a duck. Next, why do teens smoke? Well, there are a lot of reasons. There are different reasons, but I'm telling you, over the time that I'm working with them, usually it could be an older sibling, a friend, experimenting, peer pressure to fit in, be a part of, and also they think marijuana is cool. They don't think it's harmful either, and we've got a lot. It's being decriminalized and it's legalized, so what's the big deal? Because society is telling a lot of the messages, it's no big deal, but it is. To escape from problems, and it makes them feel good. It really does. And you feel lousy when you stop using. So why should I stop? I'm going to feel lousy. And I'll explain why you feel lousy. It, is a, it is a, disrupts the brain function. Go. When you get high, you smoke pot, it releases dopamine. Dopamine makes you feel good. And then you smoke pot, releases dopamine, and you feel good. Now, maybe for those of you who might not have used any substance, 
But if you drink alcohol, it makes you feel good because it's releasing dopamine. What happens is after a while, you smoke and your brain stops, reduce, stops producing dopamine or reduces it. So nothing gives you pleasure when watching a movie, going out with your family, doing something that used to give you pleasure no longer does. So you feel everything is boring, nothing makes you happy, and you can't do anything or don't want to do anything without getting high first. Because what you've done is you've stopped your brain from naturally producing dopamine. And sometimes you can't produce any more. Next. THC adheres to certain receptors in your brain. It, it attaches to the hippocampus, which plays a critical role in how we learn. This leads to problems studying, learning new things, and recalling events. I don't know where anyone else, but that's school stuff. If you can't recall events, study, learn new things, you're not going to do well in school. Next, the cerebellum is the part of the brain that controls balance and coordination. And the basal ganglia is part of the brain that's involved in movement control, which causes slower reaction time, impaired judgment, and problems responding to signals and sounds. As Pastor Glenn said, we had a gentleman who talked about working for the subways. When I first started, I ran a group with conductors, and they would say, driving the train and the buses, I smoke pot, the lights are brighter, and it makes me stop faster. Well, it doesn't. It just gives you the idea that it does. So think about that when you get on a train, a plane, a bus. It makes them react, their reaction time is faster. These 15 signs are not absolute, but if you start to see them, I would start talking to my kids. Visine, if they have a lot of incense, the small burns on the inside of the fingers only comes from smoking a joint. It's the only way your fingers are going to get yellow. I don't care what they tell you. That's right, honey, your fingers aren't yellow. Good for you. Also, marijuana stickers or bragging about 420. 420 is National Marijuana Day. The kids, the adults, everyone, 420, they know what it is. They're all smoking pot. Seemingly, they don't want to talk in front of their friends or around you. And a sudden need for money without anything to show for it. Next. Signs of depression or isolation from the family where they used to be involved, they're not. A sudden drop in grades, an A student, B student, C and D. Your teen no longer participates in activities that they used to enjoy. They appear stoned, confused, lethargic. They're not just tired. A willingness to walk the dog or take out the garbage late at night. Any excuse to get out of the house so they can go get high. Also, where they drop their old friends, the friends that they've had for a long time, and now they have a whole new bunch of friends that they're never bringing to the house. You're never meeting them. Next. These are some facts. One out of three visits to the ER are a result from marijuana. Drivers report driving within three hours of using. Why is, is that important? Because marijuana stays in your system for three or four hours. So after they're getting high, they're getting in the car and they're driving. 28% of people that are injured tested positive for marijuana. It's a lot of people on the road. Next. Smoking pot and getting behind the car doubles your chances of getting into a fatal car accident. I want to read something. It's called Death of an Innocent. I went to a party, Mom. I remembered what you said. You told me not to drink, so I drank soda instead. I felt proud inside, Mom, the way you said I would. I didn't even drink, even though the others said I should. Next. I know I did the right thing. I know you're always right. Now the party is finally ending as everyone is driving out of sight. As I got into my car, I'd get home in one piece because of the way you raised me so responsible and sweet. Next. I started to drive away, but as I pulled onto the road, the other car didn't see me and hit me like a load. As I lay there on the pavement, I hear the policeman say, the other guy is drunk, but I'm the one who'll pay. Next. 
I'm lying here dying, Mom. I wish you'd get here soon. How could this happen to me? My life burst like a balloon. There was blood all around me, and most of it is mine. I hear the medics say that I'll be dead in a short time. Next. I just wanted to tell you, Mom, I swear I didn't drink. It was the others the others didn't think. He was probably at the same party as I. The only difference is he drank and I will die. Next. Why do people drink? It can ruin your whole life. I'm feeling sharp pains, pains just like a knife. The guy who hit me is walking, Mom, and I don't think it's fair. I'm lying here dying, and all he can do is stare. Next. Tell my brother not to cry, tell daddy to be brave, and when I go to heaven, put daddy's girl on my grave. Someone should have told him not to drink and drive. If only they had told him, I would still be alive. Next. My breath is getting shorter, I'm becoming very scared. Please don't cry for me, mom. When I needed you, you were always there. I have one last question before I say goodbye. I didn't drink and drive, so why am I the one to die? Thank you. Thank you, Lily. That poem was written by a responder that was at the scene of an accident where a young girl died, and he wrote those words uh, based on what he heard her speaking just before she passed away. One day, a young man approached Jesus with a question. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This guy had a lot going for him. He was successful. He was affluent. He was smart. He was sincere. But Jesus zeroed in on one thing that was out of order in his life. He said, you've done a lot of good, but there is one thing that is wrong. Just like the rich young ruler, Jesus wants your one thing. Many of us approach God like that young guy. We hope that when God looks at us and when he evaluates our lives, he'll overlook the one thing that's out of order over here because of all the good we have going over there. But Jesus said that's not the way it works. God wants your one thing. He wants you to forsake your one thing. He wants you to surrender it, to sacrifice it. That one small area of willful disobedience. That one small indulgence that you feel entitled to. That one thing that you rely on to help you get through. For the rich young ruler, it was the love of money and the security it brought him. That might be your one thing, or it might be something different altogether. For millions and millions of Americans, their one thing is pot. Lily has shared with us what's wrong with pot from a physiological and psychological and behavioral perspective. I want to take a minute and share with you what's wrong with pot from a moral and a spiritual perspective. I want to say this, that even if pot becomes legalized everywhere, it will always be immoral. Pot is wrong. Pot is sin. Pot is one thing that unless you repent of it and put it away, will prevent you from inheriting eternal life. I want to share with you six ways that pot is spiritually and morally wrong. Six ways that pot is spiritually and morally wrong. Number one, pot is the sin of idolatry. Pot is the sin of idolatry. Don't have time this morning to get into the dialogue between Jesus and the rich young ruler, but Jesus was very sneaky. He starts talking about the Ten Commandments and he asks the young man, have you kept the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth? And the rich young ruler was very happy. He says, yes, yes, I have. 
And Jesus affirms that, yes, indeed, he did, but he got snagged on the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. And in breaking the 10th commandment, he inadvertently broke the first commandment on which all the others hinge. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The rich young ruler's sin was idolatry. In just the same way, pot is the sin of idolatry. It's the sin of putting something ahead of God in your affections. It's the sin of loving something else more than him. Last week we talked about how God has created us in such a way that our hearts are programmed to set their affections on one thing and go after them with all of our being. One of the things that strikes me about pot is the amazing hold it has on people's hearts. People who use pot love it. They have an amazing devotion toward it. They adore it. They talk about it. They brag about it with their compatriots. They venerate pot. They revel in depictions and symbols of it. They become part of an actual subculture that is built around it. People who use pot fiercely defend it. It bothers them. If anybody speaks negatively about pot, they're easily offended on behalf of pot and on behalf of all those who bow their knee to it. In fact, they are militant about defending their right to use pot. Our weed week banners that are out there on King Street were up for less than 24 hours when somebody came at the beginning of the week and under the cover of night stole them away. Either because they venerate pot or because they wanted to defend it, or both. That is $750 in banners they took. The ironic thing is, we were created to love God like that. We were created to defend God's honor like that. People who use pot are dominated by it. Can't stop thinking about it. They yearn for it. Can't wait to use it. Again, contrary to the lies that are circulating all over, pot is highly addictive. Learn from Lily that withdrawals don't even peak until about four weeks after you have stopped using. People will lie to get pot. They will manipulate to get pot. They will take dangerous risks to get pot. They will steal to get pot. Paul said, it's your master. Don't you know, whatever you submit yourself to, that is your master. If you smoke pot, weed is your God. And the Lord God says, there's not room enough for two of us on the throne of your heart. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He will love one and he will hate the other. You cannot love both Jesus and cannabis. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. It is his way or it is the broad way that leads to destruction. David has said, who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Only he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol. Paul said, don't fool yourself. Idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Beloved, listen to me. And these are serious and strong words. If you do not surrender pot to Jesus... You will miss out on God's abundant life here on earth and you will miss out on eternal life in heaven. I don't say those things to scare you. I say them to terrify you. Six ways that pot is spiritually and morally wrong. Pot is the sin of idolatry and second, pot is the sin of distrust in the Lord. Ultimately, the rich young ruler's problem was a lack of faith. His attachment to money boiled down to an issue of trust. It's actually really quite ironic. He was willing to trust Jesus with his eternal destiny, but he couldn't bring himself to trust Jesus with his earthly existence. He thought he knew better than Jesus. He thought that his own way was better than obeying Jesus. He thought that he could provide for himself better than Jesus. 
It's the same with pot. It's a sin of distrust in the Lord. People who use pot rely on it. They rely on it to ease their pain. They rely on it to help them forget about their troubles for a little bit. They rely on it to help them to calm their nerves, to help them relax and feel peaceful. Beloved, those are all things that we're supposed to rely on the Lord for. He is the source of peace that passes understanding. He is the source of joy unspeakable and full of glory. He is the source of contentment and fulfillment and security. He is the source of my strength. He is the source of healing, both emotional and physical. And let me say this, if it ever comes down to a choice between physical suffering or disobeying God, choose to obey God and suffer instead, His grace will be sufficient for you. Martin Luther said, whatever your heart clings to and relies on is your God. When people use pot, or we could put a whole bunch of other things in that blank, but when they use, they're actually saying, God, I know better than you. I know how to meet my own needs better than you. I know how to take care of myself better than you. I know what's best for me better than you. But what does the word say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your footpaths, submit to him and he'll direct your highways. Six ways that pot is morally and spiritually wrong. Number three, pot is the sin of untamed sensuality. Pot is the sin of untamed sensuality. Pot gratifies the sinful cravings of the flesh. It's giving in to the body's evil desires and obeying them. It allows sin to dominate in your mortal body. Pot is what Paul calls sowing to the flesh. It's planting bad seeds in your heart that eventually yield a whole crop of bad things. Sexual immorality and lust, shamelessness, hostility, suspicion, paranoia, isolation, hatred, fits of rage. Wherever pot is present, other sins are sure to be present. Pot might make you feel peaceful for a couple or three hours, but the long-term effects of pot are devastating on your personality and on your relationships. If you're using, let me just ask you, how is that working out for you? How are your relationships going? I doubt that they're getting better. The outcomes of pot are precisely opposite of the outcomes of being led by the Holy Spirit. Following the Holy Spirit results in love, in gentleness, in goodness. It results in self-control. Paul said the end result of pleasing the Holy Spirit is that we inherit eternal life, but the end result of untamed sensuality is destruction. Paul said in Galatians 5.21, I warn you that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Six ways that pot is morally and spiritually wrong. Number four, pot is the sin of self-defilement. It's the sin of self-defilement. Pot defiles your physical body. Lily just talked to us about that. Pot defiles your soul. It changes your personality as we just described. And pot defiles your spirit. It defiles your conscience. In the Revelation, John saw the new Jerusalem, the eternal home of all those who belong to Jesus. And he says about the new Jerusalem, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does things that defile, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Six ways that pot is morally and spiritually wrong. Number five, why am I unloading both barrels on you? It's because people keep asking, what's so wrong with it? What's so wrong with it? So I don't want to leave any stone left unturned. I want to give you all the ammunition that you can have. Number five, pot is the sin of unmitigated selfishness. Anytime I can use the word unmitigated in a sermon, it's a good day. 
Pot is the sin of unmitigated selfishness. Let me say to this, if you use pot, you are selfish, selfish, selfish. If you use pot under your parents' roof, you are selfish. Your parents deserve a kid who is fully engaged in the life of their family. They deserve a kid who is joyful. They deserve a kid who is grateful. They deserve a kid who is respectful. During that very short window of years that they have you, they deserve to enjoy you. They put up with a lot to get you. Listen, if you're a parent and you smoke pot, you are selfish, selfish, selfish. Your kids deserve a parent who is sober. Your kids deserve a parent who is lucid and in control. Your parents deserve a kid who is Christ-dependent, not codependent. Lily, last night, shared her whole testimony, and it was so powerful how Jesus set her free after 15 years of addiction. But that point that she brought out, that at whatever age you start using, you just freeze emotionally, and you go on and you begin to live life in an adult body with the emotional maturity of a 15 year old let me tell you something your kids deserve more than a 15 year old mom or a dad I don't say this to make you feel bad I say it to make you feel terrible what's the classic line of substance abuse I'm only hurting myself well first of all why would you want to hurt yourself but secondly, what a perfectly selfish thing that is to say. As if no one else in your life has the right to care about you. As if no one else in your life gets hurt watching you hurt yourself. As if no one else has the right to participate in your life. As if no one else has the right to depend upon you. As if you have no responsibility to your family or to society. It is all about you, honey. When you smoke pot, you are hurting everybody. Pot robs the people in your life today. It robs your family, it robs your employer, it robs your community, it robs society. Can I tell you that the last thing, the last thing that America needs right now in these economic times is a workforce that is stoned out of its mind. The last thing we need are city transit workers. I'm telling you, uh, one of the brothers in the church is a supervisor for the MTA and shared with us at the end of Wednesday night how many of the train operators and bus drivers are out there on the road, stoned school bus drivers, carrying your children stoned out of their minds. Do you see in Lily Slides the woman on the Taconic Parkway? who got on going the wrong way, killed herself, her daughter, killed three of her nieces, killed a father and son and a family friend and in the other car that she hit head on, she was high on pot when she had that accident. Pot robs the people that are in your life today and it robs the people that you're meant to bless in the future. Beloved, listen to me, look at me. There is a higher calling on your life than to just help yourself. God has a claim on you. He's called you to help others. Paul says God has foreordained good things for you to do. People for you to help. People for you to reach out and lift up. And you can't do that if you're stoned and enslaved to pot. Paul said for those who are selfish, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger, trouble and distress. He said we should not live to please ourselves, but to help our neighbor for good and to build him up. Six ways that pot is morally and spiritually wrong. Finally this, pot is the sin of sorcery. Pot is the sin of sorcery. Everybody look at me. In the Bible... The word for witchcraft, the word for sorcery, is the word pharmakia. That's the root of our English word pharmaceuticals, pharmacy. Drugs are inherent to sorcery. They are inherent to witchcraft. They put the mind into an altered state of consciousness so that you can contact the spirit realm. And that's exactly what drugs do. Drugs expose you to demons. 
They open up your mind to be infiltrated and influenced by demons. Listen to me. Demons are not just cute little metaphors for your hang-ups and your inner struggles and your inner turmoils. Demons are actual spiritual beings who come and infiltrate your body and torment your mind and your spirit. And when you do drugs, you open yourself up to those things. That's what puts pot in a whole different league than alcohol. Listen, alcohol addiction, it is deadly serious. I know from the experience in my own family as a childhood, I don't mean to downplay alcohol addiction in any way. It comes with its own type of demonic strongholds. But I want to tell you that pot is far worse than alcohol. Kids, potheads, teenagers, they say, oh, it's no different. What's the difference between toking up or having a glass of wine? Can I tell you there's a huge difference? Pot actually opens you up to infiltration by occult spirits. It opens you up to gross spiritual darkness and demonic deception. It opens you up to spirits of false religion. It opens you up to spirits of fantasy Magic, witchcraft, sorcery, and occult practices. It opens you up to anti-Christ spirits. Christ-hating spirits. Christian-hating spirits. Church-hating spirits. Bible-hating spirits. Truth-hating spirits. Listen to me. Pot truly is a gateway drug. It is a gateway to other drugs for sure. I asked Lily and I asked Barbara who work with us and they're they're substance abuse counselors. I said, have you ever met a drug addict? Heroin, cocaine, crack, no matter what. Have you ever met a drug addict who did not begin with pot? And in all of their years of combined experience, they could not think of a single drug addict that they had ever met that didn't begin on the road with pot. Pot is a gateway drug. And what happens is after you've used it for a while, it stops working. So you keep moving on to stronger and stuff. But even more than a gateway to other drugs, it is a gateway to the demonic realm in your life. On Wednesday evening, Pastor Nick is doing a talk during Fresh Look about demonic strongholds. He's going to be talking at 7 o'clock Wednesday about the different practices and things in our culture that have become so accepted and so widespread that come with strong demonic uh, attachments to it. Then next weekend, we're wrapping up our series, our clean series. And next Sunday night at seven o'clock, we're going to gather outside. We're going to have a bonfire. We're going to have some worship. And then we're going to ask you to surrender some things to the fire and to just bring some things to put on the fire that you need to let go of. Now, listen, if pot is your one thing, you can't put pot on the fire next Sunday night. All right. You will help you get rid of it another way. But uh, uh, we're going to get rid of these things and we're going to break the power of the bondages and strongholds. I I actually really thought we were going to burn it. And then Barbara told me, Lily, that we can't. I don't know. I'm not experienced with these things. But Lily said, Pastor, you can't burn the pot. You got to you got to flush it. You got to get it rid of it another way. Listen to me, everybody. Look at me. Pot drowns out the voice of Jesus Christ. And it drowns out the voice of his church inside of you. Revelation 18.23 says, The voice of the bridegroom, that's Jesus. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride, that's the church, shall not be heard inside of you. Because of your sorceries, because of your pharmakia, because of your drug use. The Greek word pharmakia literally means to poison. And that's what pot is. It is a deadly, deadly poison to your spirit, to your soul, and to your body. I want to ask Pastor Jason to come and the worship team to come very quickly. Denise and I have been here for 17 years now. The kids that were just knee-high when we came here, now we're looking up to many of them. We've watched them grow up and it's been a pleasure and it's been a privilege but I'll tell you no one ever has to tell me when one of our teenagers had started smoking pot no one has to bring me that piece of information because I can see it on their countenances when I stand up here and preach I see things in the spirit over people sometimes good sometimes bad sometimes it's really rather distracting 
No one has to tell me when any one of our teenagers starts smoking pot because I immediately see the veil that comes over their countenance. I see the misery. I see the demonic oppression. I see the bondage that comes over them. I'm so thankful that Peter shared his testimony and was willing to do that. That was brave. And when you see Peter, you need to just thank him for sharing that testimony. But it meant so much to me because I remember the day when I saw Peter's countenance change from something dark back to something beautiful. I remember where he was standing right there, Nick, right where you are in the back row. I remember where Peter was. He had his hands lifted up in the air. And I remember seeing the work of the Holy Spirit washing his face, washing his countenance, setting him free. I knew that God, I didn't even really know till I heard this testimony how low Peter went. I knew there were some issues. I didn't even know how bad the problem had become. But I'll tell you what, I knew I saw the day Jesus wash him. Why are we sharing all this about? Why have a weed week? Why do all this and, and share all this? It's because the number one question is, what's so wrong with pot? And Lily has told us what's physically wrong and behaviorally wrong. And on top of that, the Bible tells us what's morally and spiritually wrong. But there's one more thing I need to tell you. I have some good news today. And the good news is that Jesus can make your heart completely clean from pot. You don't have to live in slavery to marijuana. You don't have to keep poisoning your body and your mind and your spirit. You don't have to keep hurting yourself and the people you love. Jesus can set you free from captivity to pot. He said, I came with good news. I came to announce liberty to the captives. I came to announce deliverance. And He can deliver you from the grip of addiction. You don't have to keep sneaking around. You don't have to keep hiding. You don't have to keep taking risks, going to shady places and consorting with shady people. You don't have to keep blowing all your money and taking your parents' money. Jesus can set you free. He can give you life and that more abundantly. Jesus gives peace that endures. He gives joy that continually replenishes itself. You can enjoy being you, and others can enjoy you too. The Bible says God is able to save completely those who come to Him through Jesus. That means that Jesus doesn't just make you a little less addicted. He makes you 100% clean. You can be free from marijuana, and here's how. Number one, you need to repent. It's the first word of the kingdom. Repent. Admit that you've sinned and confess your sin to God and ask Him to forgive you because of what Jesus did on the cross. You need to surrender your one thing to God and you need to ask Him to take the love of it out of your heart. Maybe there's something that you need to bring to the Ephesian bonfire next Sunday night at 7 o'clock and you need to just say, God, take the love of this thing away from me. You need to submit to Jesus' leadership in your life. Listen, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you way too much to let you stay the way that you are. This is love for him, that we obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. Commit to follow Him 100% and use the resources that are available to you right here at Harvest Time Church to help you get cleaned up. Everybody look at me. We have deliverance prayer available here at Harvest Time Church. We have a 12-step recovery program that meets every Tuesday evening. We have in-house counselors available to help you. We can refer you to Christian counselors that we work with all the time that can help you. We have access to Christian residential recovery programs there is a list in your bulletin of resources listen if this is an issue in your life if this is an issue in your home I tell you go after it go after it get help reach out for HTC instead of THC Jesus can make you clean 
and we can help you. I want to ask you to stand on your feet right now, and I want you to give Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, I know we can do a little better. Let's give Jesus a big praise in this place. Thank you, Lord. I asked Pastor Jason to share one of my favorite old hymns. Listen while he plays and sing along if you know it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, while the found I know nothing. Lily did something so powerful at the end of our service last night, and she just asked how many people in the room were clean and sober and free from either addiction to alcohol or addiction to drugs, and I could not believe how many people, more, much more than half the people in that service last night. And I just want to ask, as a testimony to give glory and honor to Jesus, if you've been set free from alcohol, if you've been set free from drugs or some kind of life controlling symptom, would you just raise your hand as a testimony so people can just see? Come on. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to bow your heads with me. Jesus still makes clean. He still sets free. He still changes life. As soon as we dismiss this service, we're going to have special prayer that's available for you. And if this is an issue in your life, if it's an issue in your home, then we invite you to come and we'd love to pray with you. Our pastors and our prayer teams are here to pray with you. But I want to say to you that freedom begins with that first moment of surrender to Jesus. It begins like Paul's journey began on the Damascus Road with the moment where you bow down before God and you surrender to Him. Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? I wonder if there's somebody here. I don't, I don't care if you've grown up in church. Peter grew up in our church. He heard the gospel from the... He was in our nursery. He was uh, in our kinder church. He grew up in Sunday school. But there came a, a moment in his life when he was 24 years old when he said, God, if you'll make me into the man that you want me to be, I'll serve you the rest of the days. Maybe you grew up in our church. But you've never had that moment where you really surrendered to Jesus. If you want to pray a prayer with me today to ask Jesus into your heart to really kneel your life before him and trust yourself to him 
ask him to wash you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to do that. Would you bow your heads all over this place? And if you want to say that prayer with me, I want to just invite you to lift your hand up high wherever you are. You want to pray and you want to invite Jesus. There's one and there's two. Come on, is there someone else? There's three. There's four. Is there someone else? There's five. Is there someone else? Come on, is there someone else? I want to pray that prayer. I want to invite. This is about eternal life. This is about eternal life and abundant life. Come on, is there someone else that wants to say that prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. There's another hand. Come, Holy Spirit. Come on, is there someone else? I want to pray that prayer. Is there someone else? Thank you, Jesus. Would you lift up your hands all over this place with me, everybody? And I'm going to lead us in a prayer. We're going to invite Jesus Christ in. His blood can make you clean. Come on, let's pray. I'll lead you follow. Everyone pray with us. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need you. I admit I'm a sinner. I confess my sin to you. Jesus, forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me from sin. Take the idol off of my heart and come sit on the throne. Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I invite you now to be my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's one more thing that I want to do this morning. In Cleansing Stream, we, pl- we pray prayers of repentance and renunciation. Something very powerful that we do in the Cleansing Stream retreat. I have never used marijuana. Thankful to the Lord for that. I was actually in Bible college. I was working a summer job when I was in Bible college. I was 19 or 20 at least when I ever saw it for the first time. Somebody came into the auto parts store where I was working, smoking a joint, and I didn't know what it was. And after he left, one of the clerks came running down the aisle and, I can't believe that guy was smoking a joint out in public like that. That's the first time I ever saw it. Never used it. But I want to lead us in a prayer of repentance and renunciation. And what we do in Cleansing Stream is even if it's not your issue, just to support those in the room, we all say the prayer together. If you're using now and you want to quit, if you've used and it's something that you've never really made right with the Lord, I want to lead us in this prayer for repentance and renunciation and breaking. And then if this is an issue in your life or your family, as soon as we dismiss, I want you to come forward for special prayer. I'm going to lead us in this prayer and I want to invite everybody, if you would, if you're willing, if you would say this prayer with us, let's pray. I lead you follow. Father God, I repent for participating in marijuana. I repent for exploring. I repent for using. I repent for loving marijuana. I repent for proliferating the use of marijuana. I repent for lying, manipulating, and stealing to feed my addiction. I repent for any and all drugs that I've used subsequent to marijuana. I repent for hurting myself, for hurting others, and for hurting you, God. Marijuana, I renounce you in the name of Jesus. I renounce all other drugs. I renounce all other illicit behaviors associated with drug use. 
I renounce any and all partnerships with spirits of addiction. I cancel any actions or words that have given you a legal foothold in my life. I shut the door on you and seal it closed in the name of Jesus. And now by the blood of Jesus and through his victory at the cross, I break the power and influence of marijuana. I cancel all agreements I have made with marijuana. Marijuana, I declare that you were defeated at the cross of Christ and you are defeated in my life here today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Come on, let's give God some praise. If you need to come for special prayer, as soon as we've dismissed, I want you to come. Take the hand of the person next to you and let's give thanks. Father, now we thank you for this time in your presence. Thank you for the people you love so much. And as we go our own way, I pray the cloud of your presence would envelop us. Pray that your protection would surround us. Pray that your provision would accompany us. Pray that your providence would lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together again. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great week in Jesus. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, fresh look. And next Sunday, we'll see you. God bless you.